Last time on Improv Tabletop, we joined a troop of young builders who are on their way to Builder Camp at Camp Studston. They were led by Master Brickathon, an old and wise builder himself, along with his brother Commander Brickathon. And the troops within this troop are Pilfer the Pirate and Oleg, an interesting crew, one of them being a pirate and one of them being a Russian exchange student. Upon arriving at Camp Studston, they realized that their campsite had been stolen by the bric a troop, who is just way too pretentious and has long been a rival to Master Brickathon. And because they'd been kicked out of their regular campsite, they had to go to the haunted campsite. But, you know, that's okay. That's okay. We're at we're at Builder Camp, and it's going to be great. They took some time to start setting up their camp, building various shelters and bunkers and whatnot. But right as they were getting ready to settle down for the night, they had just been delivered uh, a crate full of stakes and crosses and holy water and silver-tipped arrows, etc. by their camp friend Scoops when something strange started to appear out of the mists behind them and began to encroach itself upon the camp. What is this creature? What is it going to do? That's what we're going to find out here in the world of the Tension Builders. What's shaking? You're listening to Improv Tabletop, the Fate RPG actual play where we make up everything on the spot. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and today I'm joined by... Caleb Anderton, the one who is too wise to be afraid of ghosts. Evan Peterson, the one who definitely isn't ripping off the pirate from the Lego movie. (laughs) (laughs) Oleg, silent. Played by Christian Randall. Oh yeah, Christian Randall. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, you guys, I'm stoked for this. I mean, let's get into it. There's this weird thing starting to make its way out of the mists. So you've got to kind of set the scene in the center of this campsite, this clearing amongst the gnarled trees, this ever-burning bonfire. And its light sheds out to about the edge of the clearing where the trees start to grow. And just beyond that is where this glowing pair of sickly yellow eyes are. And it's starting to emerge out of the mist. And you hear these strange, inhuman, almost inanimal even noises. Just this deep, ragged sort of... (sighs) Kind of breathing as it moves towards you. These wet, squelching noises against the ground as it moves. And... It has not yet entered into the radius of the light, uh, but you can see it just out beyond your vision, and all of the crows and ravens, as it appears, begin to take flight, cawing off into the skies above you as the full moon is just beginning to reach its zenith. The vultures, however, they also take to the skies, but they start circling around above you because they're ready for a little snack. And with that, we are going to just get right into this conflict here. I'm going to be featuring a new rule that I picked up from Fate Condensed. Uh, We use Fate Accelerated for our base system. But in Fate Condensed, they use a type of initiative called Balsera Style, which is named after Leonard Balsera, who introduced the idea. He's one of the designers behind the Fate system. Amazing dude. Um, With Balsera Style, it's all story-driven. We decide, based on the story, who gets to go first, and then at the end of that person's turn, they decide who goes next, and so on, until everybody has had a chance to act in this exchange. So, with that, we have Oleg was flipping around this stake in between his fingers that he doesn't have, looking all fancy, and Pilfer, you were the one who first noticed this creature, so I think it probably makes sense that Pilfer would be the first one to act. Okay, so Pilfer is going to uh, grab a vial of holy water and just rush forward and try and lob this sucker like a grenade. So go ahead and roll to attack. That seems like a pretty flashy way of attacking somebody. So go ahead and attack with flashy. And it's going to defend with quick. Wow. My last three rolls have all been exactly the same, and you've always let me do flashy, which means yet again, I got a plus four. Plus four. 
So you grab this flask of holy water and toss it at the creature. And as it starts to fly through the mist, it's kind of cutting a trail through the fog. And it catches the light from the eternal bonfire and shines a little bit of light around it, not enough to fully illuminate the creature. But as it's flying towards it, you can see it begins to approach the surface of the creature's body. And there's this... It's hard to tell exactly what th this creature is made of. There, It's this dark black color. There's an oily sheen across it. There's like bits and tufts of fur. But as the flask approaches the creature, you see the skin open up and a hole forms within the creature's body. And the flask of holy water goes flying through it out the other side and shatters against a tree behind it. Wow. I didn't expect a plus four to miss. <laughs> so this is where I'm uh, going to introduce another alternative rule that I'm picking up from Fate Condensed. And that is something that they call challenge immunity. And this is something that I think is very appropriate for a Monster of the Week style game. Because often, you know, in your Monster of the Week serial drama, they discover the monster. It's strange. They don't understand how to fight it and they need to figure out what its weakness is before they can actually defeat it. Mm. So with this challenge immunity, until you overcome the challenge of figuring out what this creature's weakness is, it cannot be damaged. Ooh. So there's going to be some interesting problem solving that comes with that in this initial conflict. But yeah, it seems like this direct attack kind of approach, even though you did roll amazing, and I'm still going to give you, because you rolled so high, you rolled enough to um, succeed with style. If you'd like to, you can reduce that damage by one to gain a boost, even though you weren't able to actually damage the creature. Yeah, then that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. All right, so the boost that I'm going to give you is a spark of understanding. I should get into the stock market making trades like this. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll just build off of that wonderful NFT success from Christian's <laughs> communal art project. <laughs> We're, we're definitely dating this podcast with all this talk of NFTs. Anyway, what? no, the they'll be around forever. <laughs> That's true, but this is right. This is at the very beginning of this craze. It's a weird world we live in, guys, and this is the real world. But in the fake world. Uh, Pilfer, as you gain this spark of understanding, that's this first moment of realizing something weird is going on with this creature. We're not going to be able to just attack this head on. So you can use that boost to your advantage later on in this encounter here. That sounds good to me. Um, and since I... Uh, well, actually, I'm thinking about this. Um, Oleg would still be flipping around. I actually think Master Brickathon, as like uh, the experienced old hand that he is, I think he's probably going to have the quickest reactions while Oleg's turning to get up and make another move right behind me. So uh, Master Brickathon will go next. Mmm, yes. In all my years. Yeah, okay. So seeing that <laughs> that had absolutely no effect whatsoever... I'd like to use my turn to use my cleverness and think and think and think and try to think of a different approach. All right. So we're going to have you roll to, I believe we would probably be rolling to overcome here. We're going to see if you can use your cleverness to maybe read your surroundings, gain an understanding of what you can use to your advantage against this creature. So go ahead and roll to overcome with clever against a difficulty of three. Let's put it at. Uh, okay, I would like to use a fate point to re-roll that. All right. So a little bit better with my cleverness. That means that is a three. A three. So you are able to tie with that difficulty. And so you're looking around and you're trying to think of what do we have around us we can use against this creature. These physical attacks don't seem to be working, but you think back to when you first arrived, uh, when you were starting to put together your lodgings, you've got a surprisingly sturdy hideout and a bomb shelter here that you might be able to use to your advantage. And you do have a free invoke on each of those, as well as your free invokes on Was That Here Before and That Old World Vibe. That's right. Oleg built the bomb shelter, right? Correct. Okay, cool. Would I have the ability still with my turn to just say, everyone, into the bomb shelter? Yeah, that is definitely a free action that you can take. And would you like to start moving towards the bomb shelter? Yes. Okay, so you start running in that direction. Who would you like to go next? Let's see, by this point, I think 
Oleg would be done doing his flippy twirls with his wooden stake. Uh, and I think it's his turn. Can I start my action by invoking one of these things? Sure. I want to try to invoke the old world vibe to see if I had like, oh, this is one of my old tales from, you know, the mother country. And I can maybe get a hint as to what powers it or what its weaknesses are. All right. So, yeah, we're going to have you roll to overcome with clever uh, to see if you can pick up any of that knowledge from behind you. And with that free invoke on that old world vibe, you instantly get a plus two or a reroll. I'm going to take the reroll because I got a minus two. Oh, man. All right. That is a plus two. Plus two. So that is a success. You're looking at this creature and you're just racking your memory for anything that, you know, the old babushkas would say around the dinner table, (laughs) the cautionary tales that they would use to scare you as a child to keep you indoors. And you would hear these stories of these beast-like, wraith-like creatures that go by many names in different cultures. But the name that we're going to go with for this creature in this culture, at least, is... The Squazniak. <laughs> the Squazniak. <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah. The name that you're most familiar with is the Squazniak for this creature. You think you might have heard in other cultures it being referred to as a bricklicant. <gasps> <laughs> Squazniak. A uh, 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 bricklicant. Uh, Would I know anything about their weaknesses or anything like that from the stories? So based on this degree of success you had, you think back to that first glimpse of the flask passing through its body, and you are able to notice, looking back, that as it approached, the bricks of the creature's body began to move out of place. So the creature was building itself almost the brick builds you okay okay (laughs) so yeah it's it's not a typical sort of anatomy that you would be familiar with as far as legs torso head etc this thing is much more fluid in its brick composition okay um hearing master brickathon summon us all to the shelter I'm going to try and use my action to make an attack and then run away. So Uh, your action would have been the overcome action to try and learn something about the creature. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. So then I'm just going to use my movement to run away. All right. You go rushing in the direction of the shelter as well. Uh, Who would you like to go next? I would like, yeah, I'll have the monster go next so that we can get maybe a little information before we have our other brother attack. All right. The creature starts to move a bit more into the campsite, and you notice the fog almost clings to it as it moves in, kind of rolling along with it, obscuring it from your vision. And it's noticing Master Brickathon and Oleg have already started running in the direction of the bunker. Uh, Commander Brickathon at this moment is just barely walking out of his tent, and he's got a couple of those big Lego steins in his hand. And he's like, hey, bro, you ready to start getting... Oh, gosh. <laughs> and the Bricklicant looks over and sees him walking out of this tent that just has, like, these neon signs bzz, 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 right here. And he is going to make a snap decision. Does he want to go for the pirate who threw the holy water at him or go for this guy that just walked out? And he decides that he is going to go for Pilfer. So he rushes in and there is a speed that is just kind of unfathomable to you. It's a distance away from you and then suddenly it's right in front of you and you feel claws rake against your chest. So it is going to attack with quick and it's going to get a plus five. Oh, baby. What do I defend with? What does your defense look like? Are you just kind of trying to take it full brunt on? Are you trying to dodge out of the way? I would like to try and jump in the air and do the splits and have his claws go underneath my legs. (laughs) All right. I'd say that is that is more flashy than quick, I would say. So you can defend with flashy. I got a plus five. Plus five. All right. The Bricklicant is going to spend a fate point to invoke don't bother the locals. Mm. And it's also going to use that free invoke on don't bother the locals as well. And as you go to jump, there's this ghost that wafts right in front of your face and takes you off guard. So that is going to increase his roll to a plus eight. Can I ask a quick mechanical question? Uh, Sorry, that would be a plus nine. Uh, Yeah, go for it. Wow. What are the benefits to uh, invoking our own troubles again? Or are those only compelled upon us? Uh, You can invoke your trouble at any time. 
Um, the idea behind having a treble specifically is you want all of your aspects to be kind of double-edged. Uh, generally, they'll be a bit more positive and can be used by you, but that also gives me a way to make your life a bit more complicated and interesting at times. Okay. I, th- I, I, could, I thought I remembered there was some sort of, like, you get a bonus or something if you invoke your own trouble, but okay. Don't you get a... So, yeah, I can offer a compel to any of you, but you can also compel yourself to fail, and you get a free fate point for doing that. I was wondering if I could do that here with my peg leg and say that as he goes to do the splits, he uh, stumbles on his leg and falls over. I think that is very, very on point. You get a free fate point for that compel, And as you stumble over your peg leg with this ghost wafting in front of your face, just completely taking you off guard, that claw grabs you up in the air and slams you against the ground. You feel the air rush out of your hollow plasticky torso (laughs) and you take four stress. Wow. That's a lot of damage. That (laughs) is on track for our first death in the podcast. (laughs) <laughs> well, you still have two stress and some consequences left. Oh, boy. That is, yeah, when do consequences come in? Because you went past legendary on your roll there. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a consequence and stress are just different ways that you can mitigate taking stress during a combat. So you can either just assign those directly to your stress track and mark off four of those boxes, or you can try and mitigate that with one of your consequences. You can mitigate two with mild, four with medium, and six with severe. Okay, so when would I do that? Anytime you take stress, you can either assign it to the stress track or to the consequences. The thing to keep in mind with consequences is they're sticky. Uh, That becomes an aspect that is on your character sheet that you can invoke or that can be invoked against you until you take the time to heal it. You know what? Let's get a moderate consequence up in here. I oh, want to see shoot. what that's like. So your stress track is still empty, but you're going to take a moderate consequence. Yeah, and I want to see it. What that's <laughs> going to look like is as he slams you down to the ground, that force is so intense that one of your arms pops out of its socket. Okay, I'm missing an arm. Kind of uh, on par for your characters, it seems. It's better this time around, though, because you're a Lego. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, th- there's no blood. It's just a little. Yeah, d- Ned, didn't you get rid of someone's limb in the la- in the fallout back too? Did I? I feel like someone lost a leg. No, I b- I broke my leg. Oh, you broke it. Okay, you didn't lose it. Yeah. So yeah, you get slammed down to the ground, and you see your arm pop off up into the air, and as it spins around, you see a tendril of bricks reach out from inside the creature and wrap around the arm and pull it back into the central mass. Okay. <laughs> I like that. All right. Sounds good. Time to get a hook hand. Yeah, a hook shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> just a little hook coming out of you. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just coming out of the shoulder. <laughs> like, it's a normal-sized hook, but just, you know. What an image. What a wonderful thing that we've done. I'm so glad we decided to do Legos. Uh, but, yeah, now that it is the end of the Bricklicant's turn, uh, it is time for... Commander Brickathon to go. So he sees this going on, and you know, he's kind of a skeevy dude, but when it comes down to it, <laughs> he has a good heart. And he's going to rush in there and he's going to try and get you out of this situation because you're currently pinned under the creature's claw. And he rushes forward and he's going to try and distract this creature so that you can get out. So he's going to roll to overcome with Flashy. And he gets a plus three. He succeeds with style. And so, yeah, the Bricklicant is completely focused on you at the moment. And he runs in and he takes one of those steins that he's holding and he chucks it at the creature's head. And even though it's not paying attention, you see the head, the bricks just morph out of the way with this weird wet clacking noise. And the stein goes flying through but that's enough to kind of put the creature off balance. It stumbles backward, removing its claw from your chest and turns to look at Commander Brickathon. And what he does is he does like a baseball style slide into your position and he knocks you out of the way and you go sliding in the direction of the bunker and he is now in the spot that you used to be occupying. Wow, what a hero. Trying to get those Grunkle Stan vibes, you know? (laughs) Yes. So now that Commander Brickathon has concluded his action, 
he's going to pass the turn to Master Brickathon. I said to get in the bunker. Why is nobody else in this bunker? Uh, and I'm going to hunker down inside. And from there, looking through the other things, uh, holy water didn't work. Um, this guy seems pretty impervious to everything, but I'm going to I'm gonna shoot a crossbow at him with a silver tip. All right, roll to attack with... Let's make that careful as you're aiming. Uh, plus two. Plus two. Bricklicant is going to defend with quick, getting a plus four. Shoot. That you did. And <laughs> the arrow once again goes sailing directly towards it, and the Bricklicant sees it coming this time, and uh, the arrow being a pretty narrow projectile, it opens up just like the merest crack between a couple of its bricks, and it goes flying through, and it pins one of the ghosts to a tree on the edge of the campsite. I believe this thing is beyond us. Everyone into this bunker, please. All right. Who goes next? Let's go back to uh, Pilfer. Ned, is this thing currently in the light? So it has gotten closer to the eternal bonfire. That mist is still following it around, so you can't get a real good look at it. But you're starting to get a sense of the size, the bulk of this creature. And it's easily maybe two and a half times as tall as you guys. How close am I to the entrance of our camp? So he, when he kind of did that baseball slide, he pushed you in the direction of the bunker. And we'll say that was decently close to the entrance. So you would be able to make it to the entrance of the camp during this turn or into the bunker, whatever your choice may be. I'm going to look at the bunker, look at the monster, look at Brickathon, look back and forth like three different times and then turn and see the smoke coming from the Brickabrack troops camp. And I'm just going to beeline it. <laughs> Traitor! <laughs> <laughs> so is this a diversion attempt or an escape attempt? This is, I just lost an arm and I want to go where the organized, safe, comfortable people are. <laughs> All right. So go ahead and roll to overcome with sneaky, because um, we don't want this thing to find you. And it's going to roll with clever to try and notice you moving in that direction. That's a zero. A zero? It also rolled a zero. I'm like desperately looking through uh, what we can invoke here. Um, can I say I get a little extra burst of speed from the good meal I had and invoke an army marches on its stomach? Yeah, so in addition to your stealth, you also get on a burst of speed and you go kind of scuttling out of the campsite here without anybody noticing your egress. Okay, uh, that's my turn. I'm just heading straight for the bric brac troop. <laughs> but I'll say this. Since uh, it started to kind of notice something was going on, I'll let the creature go next. All right. So the Bricklicant, it is very, very focused on Commander Brickathon at this point, having just taken its prey from it. And what the Bricklicant is going to do is try and grab Commander Brickathon and start pulling him out of the campsite back towards the woods. And so he's going to do that with Forceful and gets a plus five to do so. I'm going to have Commander Brickathon roll also with Forceful to try and not get pulled out. He rolls a plus one, but he's got some free invokes here. He's going to get one of those free invokes on was that there before. He looks down and he notices this pile of sand next to him. And he grabs that, he chucks it up into the Bricklicant's face. And this particulate matter being so small, the Bricklicant isn't able to kind of move out of the way enough and becomes kind of temporarily blinded. So that brings him up to a plus three. And he is also going to invoke the free invoke onto the bomb shelter. He hears his brother yelling, hey man, get over here. We need to be safe. So that brings him up to a plus five, which is a tie against the Bricklicant. So that currently means that the Bricklicant would succeed at a minor cost. So here's what I'm going to say is what's going to happen here. The minor cost is that he's not going to get the guy he initially wanted. He's tugging on Commander Brickathon, trying to get him into the woods. But this guy is too scrappy and too toughened and wizened with age to let loose. But at that moment, Pilfer, as you're rushing out of the campsite, you notice that Scoops is coming back towards the campsite. 
and <laughs> he's got uh, a tub that he's got like a bunch of uh, you see like wrapped Twinkies and oatmeal cream pies and stuff. And he's just kind of mumbling, "Got to keep the people in the Hana campsite happy. Got to keep them happy." And you sneak <laughs> past him, and he comes walking into the campsite, and he's like, "Hey guys, I brought you some. Oh my goodness!" And the Bricklicant hears this scream and he goes, okay, I'm not going to worry about this guy, this, this crotchety old man here who's probably going to be too tough for me to chew through. I want this young, tender staff member here. <laughs> so let's go of Commander Brickathon and shoots out a tendril directly at Scoops. It wraps around his leg and he starts pulling Scoops into the tree line. And now that the Bricklicant has concluded his turn, I'm going to pass that to Oleg. Just to clarify, I didn't have any sort of solid idea as to what a weakness was from the old stories, right? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, I'm going to try and use the Brick Builds You. Um, I'm going to take my little claw hand without opposable thumbs, and I'm going to clutch at my little brick on a chain around my neck and kiss it and uh, <laughs> invoke the old the old religion that I believe in. All right. The brick builds you. Um, and I'm going to have I'm going to try and take my one unbendable leg and my other unbendable leg and kind of jump up in the air and stomp down really hard to make the bricks kind of ripple and hopefully latch onto the bottom of this creature to hold him in place. I like the style. Wow. So let's have you roll to overcome with clever. Okay. <laughs> Do I get any bonuses with the brick builds you? Yeah, so when you roll, if you decide that you don't like the result of that, you can spend a fate point to invoke that aspect. And how many fate points do you start with? Three. Okay. Um, I don't like that roll, so I'm going to invoke, and that lets me re-roll it? Yeah, you spend a fate point, and you can either re-roll or add a plus two. I'm going to add a plus two, making it a total of four. Four. That is success with style. Nice. So you send out this divine shockwave. You think about the great brick in the sky that has built you <laughs> from just these little bits of polymer strands. And as you <laughs> slam into the ground, you can see the shock wave rippling outward as the bricks kind of jump up before falling back into place. And it takes the Bricklicant off guard. And the Bricklicant stumbles and its grip around Scoops is beginning to lessen. And so with that, you're going to get a free invoke on the aspect, that old world vibe, as you've brought kind of this aspect of your faith into the situation here. That might give Scoops a bit of an advantage later on if he wants to try and escape from this thing. So who would you like to go next? We've got Commander Brickathon and Scoops still left in the initiative. I'm going to have Commander Brickathon go next to maybe try and give Scoops another little boost to try and get out of there. All right, Commander Brickathon, his main thing is he wants to get into the bunker. Scoops, he's not one of his troop members, so he doesn't have to worry about him. So he rushes towards the bunker to leap in, but he is going to kind of toss a casual word back over his shoulder towards Scoops. He's like, hey, don't worry, you got this kid. So he's going to uh, roll to create an advantage for Scoops against a fairly high difficulty because it's not a very encouraging thing he's saying. So I'm going to say that's rolling against a difficulty of four and he only gets a plus three. So he does fail in that attempt. And with that, that brings us to Scoops on his turn. And Scoops reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his little pocket knife and he's going to try and extricate himself from the Bricklicant here. So he's going to roll to attack with Clever, and he gets a plus three to that. The Bricklicant is going to defend with Quick and gets plus two. Go Scoops. He stabs out with the knife, and he's like, don't worry, I got this in the bag. Stabby stab, but the bricks move out of the way. He was not there to understand that this creature works a little bit differently. And there's kind of some horror on his face as he comes to this realization. That brings us to the next round. And I'm going to pass the turn to the Bricklicant. And it clamps the bricks down around that hand that's holding the pocket knife. And begins to try and absorb scoops into his own mass. So he's going to roll to attack with... I mean, we don't have a weird approach. 
or an unsettling or disturbing approach, that would be the most appropriate one here. So I'm just going to have him do it with forceful. He's just dragging this guy, kind of kicking and screaming into that central bulk. He rolls a plus six. Whoa. Scoops is going to roll to defend with quick. And he gets a plus four. But he is going to invoke that free invocation on that old world vibe to bring it up to a plus six. They are now on even standing with each other. <laughs> uh, do I want to complicate this? <laughs> oh, boy. You know what? I have one more fate point. The Bricklicant is going to spend his final fate point for the encounter to bring his total up to a plus eight. And the aspect that he is going to invoke is a personal aspect that he has that you guys are not familiar with yet, unfortunately. So there is there is a mechanic within the game that you can, uh, in addition to being able to create new aspects or use existing aspects to your advantage with creating an advantage, you can also try and discover an existing aspect that you don't currently know about. So the Bricklicant has some aspects that you don't currently know, and moving forward, you can try and use create an advantage to discover what those might be. So it invokes that aspect, bringing it up to a plus eight against Scoops' plus six, and sucks Scoops into that central mass, and with that unnerving quickness, shuffles its way back into the darkness, and after a while, that weird wet thumping and clicking noise disappears into the distance. Oh no. Smash cut! to uh, pilfer the pirate as he is just now on the outskirts <laughs> of the good campsite, not the haunted campsite, the good campsite. <laughs> and you see the builder master is up there with his accordion and he's playing a mournfully beautiful old cowboys kind of song, this ballad on the accordion. And he's singing along with it in a voice that is the clarion call of a crystal glass being struck at the princess's birthday. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a good voice. And all of the young builders here are just kind of swaying in time with this beautiful song as you come stumbling, just completely bedraggled, missing an arm up to the edge of the campsite. I'd like to um, walk into the campsite and grab the uh, bugle that they leave by the gate for their troop bugler to blow each morning, and I just want to grab it and just... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're definitely going to get people's attentions. Do you want to try and make this a good bugling noise that will be enjoyable to hear? Or... I want to make it a loud bugling noise. <laughs> All right. So I figure loud we don't have to worry about. So you make a loud bugling noise that is unpleasant to the ear and bad to hear. And all the troops here in the bric-a-brac troop jump. And you can see as they do, it's like their heads and torsos separate from their legs and shimmer in the air before clacking back <laughs> down into one piece. And they uh, turn towards you with shock in their eyes. And the Builder Master stands up and puts his accordion to the side and says, Well, my young lad, that is quite a noise you have made. How might the Bric-a-Brac troop be of service to you this fine evening? At, at, at our campsite, a monster came out of the woods and, and took me arm. That sounds like a bad time. Young ones, first aid to the rescue. And a bunch of the bric-a-brac troopers uh, jump up and they start grabbing like bits of tape and whatnot and come rushing towards you. I'm just picturing like a, one of those little Lego studs just being shoved in the hole that has like a red plus sign on it. <laughs> <laughs> and they come running up to you and one of them says, where's the tourniquet? And the guy goes, tourniquet's right here and pulls out a little stud with a red plus sign on it and jams it into the hole in the side of your torso. That was such a good Lego noise. I've heard that in the games. <laughs> Dude, that's why we have Caleb. He is a master voice professional over here. I'm the Foley artist over here. <laughs> yeah. So um, as they're starting to patch you up, the Builder Master comes over to you and says, Pardon me, young lad, but where is your arm? We cannot finish this healing procedure unless we have the proper pieces. <laughs> ah, weren't you listening? The monster took me arm into the forest with it. If you're being hazed by your troop, it's okay to let us know. 
That's the kind of thing you should talk about. <laughs> no. <laughs> Ye are our problem. Ye took our campsite. We were supposed to stay here. And you notice his eye twitches a little bit when you say that. And he says, Ah, so you are with Master Brickathon's troop, are you not then? Aye. Well, just to show how much we appreciate Master Brickathon and Commander Brickathon, we are going to send you back with a gift. Just to show how wonderful we are and how much we love you. I, I don't... <laughs> We don't need a gift. We need your help. Oh, I insist I have here some Choco Tacos just for you. Can't you send a patrol back with me to look at the campsite? Yes, of course. I think that will be just fine. Young ones, and he snaps his, um, he snaps his weird claw hand in a way that somehow produces a snapping <laughs> noise. And he says, yes, now... Patrol X, I'm going to need you to assist this young man back towards his campsite and make sure that these Choco Tacos are dispersed to everybody. They are delicious. <laughs> You're really only doing this much to help, Hardy. Ah, uh, well, I can't quite take all of the strain away from you because that's not how you watch somebody grow. You have to push somebody out of the nest to see them fly. Isn't that right, boys? And they all say in unison, yes, Master Bricklebarrel. You don't believe me. You don't believe that a monster came out of the forest. Son, we always hear the rumors about the haunted campsite and people disappearing every year, but the staff ensures us that there is no strange things going on. I'm sure it's just all of the the, the hoodoo stories around the campfire getting to your little head. Uh, and I uh, just turn around and go, All right, then. Well, when the monster comes to get ye, I won't help ye either. And he uh, pats you on the head and says, That's just fine. Remember the builder slogan, Do a good turn for somebody that's actually your friend. And only your friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to reach out in my back pocket on my way out and uh, pull another whole live fish and just toss it over my shoulder so that it hits it right in the face. <laughs> Roll to attack with Sneaky. It's a plus two. Plus two. It slaps him right in the face, and he's going to take two dignity strain from that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Patrol X is walking along with you, and they're moving in lockstep with each other at your side, just in a perfectly straight line, and... It looks more like, instead of like the professional Lego movie style animation where everything's, you know, blocky but smooth, this looks like the Lego animation that you tried to make in like fourth grade with some friends as a stop motion thing. <laughs> and it's just rigid step, 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 step <laughs> right next to you. Ah, you look like you'd make a good crew. Have you ever considered working on a ship? They pause and the patrol leader turns towards you and says... We are all hoping to get our sailing badge tomorrow. Aye, well, when you do, I might have work for you. That sounds wonderful. We do have the Battle of Studston Lake coming up soon. I'll show you a real battle. A battle on the high seas for treasure and for the love of a beautiful dame. <laughs> and the, the young man <laughs> says, Dames? Master Bricklebarrel says we're not allowed to have dames. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're a free sailor out on the seven seas, you can take whatever you'd like, as long as, you know, the dame wants to be taken. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this young man, you see, he has just the shining admiration in his eyes, and he says, the true pirate way. Aye, the true pirate way. Come, let's take care of this, and then tomorrow I'll teach you everything I know. And you come back into the camp as uh, Master Brickathon and Commander Brickathon and Oleg are kind of gaining stock of what has just happened. And this line of uh, young builders with these bright lanterns comes marching into the campsite. As I'm taking stock of things, I'm going to wide-eyed walk over to my pack and open it up. Um, and I'm going to pop my head off. And I'm going to reach in and I'm going to pull out my, my Russian head and put that one on instead. Uh, he's a little more prepared for these kinds of things. So it's the same exact face, but he's got like uh, a bit of a five o'clock shadow on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, as they come marching in, the patrol leader gives a salute and turns towards you. Pilfer and says, well, here you are safe and sound. 
and turns towards the rest of you and says, At the behest of Master Brickle-Barrel, we have brought you some sumptuous choco tacos as a sign of goodwill. From Master Brickle-Barrel, you say? Yes. He told us that great honor must be shown to the wonderful Master Brickathon and the lesser wonderful Commander Brickathon. You can tell Master Brickle-Barrel that he can keep his choco tacos and that I hope he gets eaten by a monster like that poor unfortunate Scoops. Master Brickathon, please. They was only trying to help. Look what they did to me arm. And I'll show him the red plus sign tourniquet. <laughs> the patrol leader turns towards the guy immediately standing behind him and says, Giles, did you get that note for Master Brickle Barrel? And he holds up a pad and says, yes, word for word. Well, I mean... To be sure there is no funny business, I would like you, Giles, to eat the first Choco Taco. Giles uh, kind of puts his claw-like hand up to his mouth and says, Master Pricklebarrel says we're only allowed one Choco Taco per day. Hey, remember the pirate's rule. Take what you can, give nothing back, as long as the dame is into it. <laughs> You're a quick hand. Consent is very important. I am giving you permission to eat another. And Giles, with shaking claws, opens up the Choco Taco and, with a wide-eyed smile, takes a single bite. And he says, Master Brickleberry would be so angry if he saw me doing this, but it feels so good to be rebellious. Ah, Choco Tacos for everyone! And I start handing them out to the whole patrol. And they all sit down around the eternal fire, and they start handing out the Choco Tacos, and Giles hands one to the left, and he notices there's a ghost there, and he jumps a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But they settle down around your fire, and they just start gorging themselves on these Choco Tacos. You can tell that while things are shiny over at the campsite where the Bric-a-Brac troop is staying, you know, maybe there's trouble in Tahiti, as it were. Now, Master Brickathon, I know you're in charge of me, and while I understand that... I'd prefer ye not harass my crew, no matter where they came from. It's all right, we could use extra manpower. Obviously, we are dealing with things that are beyond our ken. Um, I'd like to reach to my pack again, and I'm just like Mary Poppins, I'm just pulling out this incredibly long and complicated looking machinery with this really tall wire that sticks up into the air and this little tiny computer screen. I'm just going to start taking my two claw hands and clicky clacking on it to connect to Sputnik. Um, (laughs) Because now I definitely know what that thing is called. So I just need a little more information. So I'm going to use Sputnik to try and figure out a little more information about this creature. All right, we're going to do some information gathering. Roll to overcome with clever. We'll put that a difficulty of two now that you've got uh, the entirety of the Russian internet at your fingertips. (laughs) A two is fair. Um, I got a two. A two, which on the ladder of adjectives is fair. Exactly like you said. (laughs) So, yeah, you are clacking through clicker, clacker, clicker, clacker. What information can I get? So you've tied to overcome. So you are going to succeed at a minor cost. And you start to gain some information about this Bricklicant being downloaded onto your little communications device here. And you develop an understanding that some of these aspects about the Bricklicant, like we talked about, you can try and learn what those are. So I guess instead of overcome, that would be creating an advantage to discover an existing aspect. You discover that the aspect that is most significant, the high concept aspect, is mutable form. So that's something that it often uses to its own advantage, but something that if you understand what its weakness is, you can use against it as well. Okay, so since, if we, since we know its high concept is mutable form, that means we can also mute it? So you can invoke that aspect against it, uh, a hostile invoke, um, and you can use that to power your own actions against the Bricklicant, and how that looks in the moment is up to you. All right. Um, I'm going to turn around to the group and say... <laughs> uh, uh, listen, uh, he, he uh, m- mutate. Yes, we mutate him. Very good. Mm, yes, it is just like the fourth principle of the brick moves you. <gasps> da. Is Scoop dead? <laughs> I saw him eaten, absorbed into the bricklicant. As one of the staff, we can only hope that he would give the bricklicant indigestion or perhaps a staff infection. Oh my god. 
<laughs> you know, I'm I'm going to take a cue from Savage Worlds, and I'm going to give you a fate point for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So you've gained some knowledge about the Bricklicant. Um, moving forward, uh, you can do some more research around the camp to try and gain more information uh, that you can use in your next fight. But for the time being. As the full moon is beginning to go down towards the horizon, Patrol X uh, finishes up their Choco Tacos and they turn towards Pilfer and give you some deep bows of respect and say, thank you very much for teaching us that there is more to life than just doing everything the man says. I hope to see you down by the water soon. Of course. Master Bricklebarrel has been talking about how we're going to wipe the, well, wipe the, wipe the lake bed with you guys during the Battle of Studston Lake tomorrow. Well, you're a formidable crew. You might just do just that. Now, before you go back to him, I found these, and I pull out the box that Scoops dropped of Twinkies and oatmeal cream pies, and I say, take a few of these back with you, but don't let him see them. And they all recoil in kind of <laughs> shock for a moment there, and eventually Giles moves forward and says, this is sinful, but it feels so good. We will do it. A pirate must learn to be sneaky. Like, he probably didn't know I had this. And I pull out a revolver. <laughs> <laughs> and Giles says, we did not know that, but that's good to know. That, that's actually, that's very good to know that there's, you're just packing heat around this place. And apparently there's no repercussions for that. Not when they can't find it. And I hide it again. And by hide it, I mean I, like, lift my entire torso off my legs and shove it down into the leg cavities. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and Giles uh, does like that meme with the guy tapping his head, except he can't extend a finger, so he's just tapping his temple with one of his claws. <laughs> and he says, lesson learned. And they all get into formation and start marching back towards the good campsite in their rigid manner. And I return to the rest of the group and I say, they're going to make a fine crew for me someday. Pilfer, you continuously impress me, besides running away and turning traitor. Other than that, you have done good things, like finding a crew that might be a valuable asset for all of us, not just for you. And Commander Brickathon steps forward and says, You see, I said we were going to get along. Here you are, pilfering the other troop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I go, I, I appreciate your understanding. I've been told that I am mature beyond my years. Well, if that's the case, I think it's time for a drink. And he pulls out a few more of those steins and offers a toast over the eternal bonfire. And as you all make merry, jovial laughter mingling with that of the other troops around you, we are just this this very small cluster of light against the darkness and the mist encroaching all around you. The buzzards, disappointed at the lack <laughs> of a meal tonight, settle back down onto the trees to watch you. And that is where we're going to conclude today's episode of Improv Tabletop. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with more adventures in the world of the Tension Builders. If you want more, go ahead and subscribe. Maybe even give us a review. We'd be as happy as a, as a repressed young scout who has learned that it's okay to eat Choco Tacos if you go ahead and give us a positive review. We're also on Twitter, at Improv Tabletop. If you'd like to suggest either a setting for us to play in or an aspect for one of our characters to use, tweet about us using hashtag ImpTab setting or hashtag ImpTab aspect. Uh, let's do a round of plugs. What I would like to plug this time is the Monster of the Week RPG system. Um, the inspiration for having this condition immunity where you have to discover the weakness before you can harm the monster, uh, that was taken from uh, Monster of the Week which incidentally was created by the same company that created Fate, Evil Hat Productions. And so give these guys a look. Learn more about Fate, learn more about Monster of the Week, learn more about uh, Agon and all the other cool products that they're creating because Evil Hat Productions, they know where it's at. Caleb, what you got going on? Um, I have taken a cue from the rest of my friends and I've, I'm going to be doing a bit of performance artwork, um, a bit like what Evan and others have done in the past. You know, we're still at COVID-19 restrictions um, around here in Washington State. There's a lot of those still. So uh, I'll just be going to Trader Joe's and buying a bunch of products on the inside of the store 
and offering to trade them to people outside the store. So I will be Trader Joe outside of Trader Joe's and see what I get. And I'll let you guys know next week. That's pretty impressive. You can get some good stuff through trading. That's what I think. And I'm trying to bring it back as, you know, trading and butter- bartering system. We've overcomplicated the thing with money, I think. Yeah, hopefully the, uh, let's see, I look forward to seeing the awesome cosplay that you come up with for Trader Joe because I've never actually seen what Trader Joe looks like. It's going to be good. All right. Evan, what you got going on? Uh, so I've been thinking as we've been recording and when I was a repressed scra- scout, um, my first time at scout camp, it wasn't a Choco Taco. And this, this is a true story. <laughs> I spent almost all the money I brought to scout camp with me on. I don't remember the name that the name brand gave them, but they're those chocolate chip cookie ice cream sandwiches. Oh, that yeah. Little mm. Bunny makes. I went nuts on those. And so in honor of the repressed campers of our story, I'm going to eat 200 of them over the next one. <laughs> one for every troop member of the bric a brac troop. Exactly. <laughs> Just this army. I mean, they've got patrols up through X at least, so. It's true. Nice. Okay, well, let me know uh, how your indigestion goes. Man, you, you just have this way of doing things that are not good for your longevity as a member of this podcast here, but follow your bliss, man. Christian, what you got going on? Well, I was really inspired last time by your beautiful call to wellness and health. And I really just decided to take kind of a deep dive, look into how I could be healthier, lose a few pounds, burn a few calories. And you know how it is when you're Googling or web searching, I guess. One thing leads to another. I started Googling origins of my name, everything like that. Turns out Christians used to have some really cool ways to burn calories, mainly with fire. Um, <laughs> there was the Inquisition. There were the Crusades. There were witch trials. I'll tell you what, they had some ways to burn calories. So uh, I'm going to bring it back. That's uh, sort of where I'm headed this week. I bought myself a spit. I think it's big enough for me. <laughs> Um, So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do at least a 30-minute roast every day, see how that does with uh, losing some weight, and uh, I'll get back to you next week. Randall's Rotisserie. That is a a good name. (laughs) Better than what I had. (laughs) It's a dry heat. It's like a sauna. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to... You don't want to... You'll just... You'll sweat the pounds away. That's the dream. That's the goal. Nice. Well, thank you all for listening to Improv Tabletop, your fitness gurus, as we explore the world of the tension builders. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and I've been joined by... Caleb Anderton, the only one in the bunker. (laughs) Evan Peterson, the one without an arm. And Christian Randall, the two-faced. Much love and stuff. We'll catch you next week on Improv Tabletop. (laughs) 